Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Gospel Night as we go over Matthew chapter 14. Uh, before we jump in, let's uh, <coughs> pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today, Lord God. Uh, thank you that we can study your word again in this place. Um, I pray, Lord God, that you open up our hearts and our minds to see you, um, that your word is truth and that it's meant to instruct us and to give us life. And we praise you, Lord God, and help us to be more, more like you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, we're jumping into Matthew chapter 14, and uh, let's get started. So we'll start with verses 1 through 2 here. So at that time, Herod the, te the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. So uh, let's just uh, start off with, um, well, right here, this uh, uh, Herod and um, him being the Tetrarch. Now, a, a Tetrarch was a position that the Romans gave um, to someone to govern an area of the country, or of a country. And Judea was a province that we know today as the Holy Lands in the Middle East, um, but then was under Roman occupation and influence of their, uh, under the influence of their empire. Now the Herod here um, that the word speaks about is Herod um, Antipas, um, not to be confused with um, his father, Herod the Great, you know, that we know from the Christmas story. Um, now, of course, Herod the Great, that's a relative term. He wasn't that great. But, um, but he was a man, uh, uh, he was the Herod Antipas, um, Herod the Great's son, was the man um, in this position as Tetrarch under the Roman Empire at this time uh, in the region of Judea. Now, um, why is John the Baptist mentioned? Because if we remember here, um, he was imprisoned um, back in uh, Matthew chapter four. And now from this text, it implies that he is dead and reincarnated uh, into this Jesus fellow um, that's starting to you know, stir up trouble in his region. And in this section, um, we do a little back and forth. So if, uh, stay with me here. Now, if we uh, remember back, John the Baptist uh, was well known throughout the region as a prophet um, and known to be a righteous man. And many of the, in the Jewish community at this time um, were living in an age where messianic prophecy was uh, about to be fulfilled. And some thought that Jesus was John the Baptist uh, reincarnated and, you know, the Messiah. Now, of course, Herod um, Antipas was one of these people who falsely thought this um, and you know, to explain the miracles that Jesus was performing. Uh, but now we see an explanation, um, if we move on in the, in the text here, as to why Herod Antipas um, had John the Baptist killed to begin with in verses 3 through 12 here. So um, we'll just start reading here. So in verse 3, it says, For Herod had laid hold, upon, had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, Herod to John the Baptist, he feared the multitude because they counted him a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, Herod, he promised with an oath to give her what he, whatever she may ask. So she being given, uh, so she having been prompted by her mother said, "Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter." And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And then the disciples came, Jesus', Jesus disciples came and took away uh, John the Baptist's body and buried it and went to told Jesus. So a lot going on here. To sum it up cleanly though, uh, Herod Antipas was divorced himself and married um, a woman <coughs> named Her Herodias who was divorced herself and the ex-wife of his half-brother Philip. So John the Baptist, who again was well known and regarded um, publicly, denounced their marriage and criticized um, uh, and criticized it as sinful. So Herod uh, imprisoned John the Baptist 
um, but didn't kill him outright. Um, you know, against the wishes of Herodias, his his uh, his wife now, because the Jews around him and his dominion um, still saw uh, John the Baptist as a holy prophet, as we see <laughs> back in verse five, um, where it says uh, he feared. He being uh, Herod here feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. So Herodias had this plan to get rid of John the Baptist. Um, however, during the celebration of Herod's birthday, now her her daughter Herodias' daughter danced for him and pleased him enough um, to the point where Herod would give her whatever she asked for. Now, I guess you know his uh, uh, Herodias, knowing this would happen, already kind of planted in her daughter to request for John the Baptist to be killed. Now, since Herod was in the company of his court and ranking people of society, he couldn't deny her request, regrettably. Um, he didn't want to do this, but he wanted to keep his promise and had John killed in his prison cell and the head brought to him before everyone on a platter. Now, this news was found out by the disciples and you know they passed it along to Jesus. So now we tie everything together um, and we move on now to, uh, to verse uh, 13 here. So when Jesus heard this, he departed from uh, there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Uh, but when the multitudes heard, uh, heard it, they followed him on foot to the cities. Um, now here it says, now, now according to the early church father, fathers, this verse is to be interpreted as Jesus hearing and and uh, Jesus hearing this in reaction, not to the death of John the Baptist himself, but the fact that Herod Antipas said that Jesus was John the Baptist reincarnate. Now that's important. You know, keep that in the back of your mind while we uh, while we run through this chapter. Um, and uh, of course, now Jesus here, um, obviously he was a celebrity kind of in this in this in this part in these parts, and crowds always would find him. So here, um, it says in verse 14, when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved, moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Now remember, when we go through the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels, miracles and healings were all to point to God's redemptive plan for humanity as a whole through Jesus Christ, as well as a reflection of his love for us to be our provider and healer and source of help and comfort. And moving forward now to verses 15 through 19. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And in verse, seven, uh, in verse 17, And they said to him, Jesus, the disciples to Jesus, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He, being Jesus, said, bring them here to me. And in verse 19, it says, Jesus, then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he, Jesus, took the five loaves and the two fish and looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So, Obviously, this story sets up for uh, one of Jesus' most well-known uh, miracles uh, that we as Christians have heard, I'm sure, many times, even in Sunday school, um, of feeding the, the multitude. And in verse 20, it says, So they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. So God's provision here was so great that not only did he, from only five loaves and two fish, feed about 5,000 people, but that there were even leftovers uh, after even everyone ate to be full. And not just, you know, everyone ate to have a little Costco sample of things, but it says, the text says that they ate to be full. Um, because the word says, and they were filled. Here we are reminded always, of course, to bless the food that we eat as it's God's provision that has been provided to us. But um, we also see here how great God is, that he provides for our needs when we find ourselves with not enough, yet he provides abundantly even for us, and enough so that we even have leftovers afterwards. He overfills our cup. Remember, though, that this is all to point to Christ and not to build up for ourselves, but that God is a father, and he is a good father. 
Um, so this was after, of course, doubts of Jesus' disciples, who, remember, uh, just wanted to send everyone away to go into the village and, and figure out dinner. But, you know, this is Jesus, the Son of God. This is 100% man, 100% God. He is the Messiah. Um, so we move on now to verses uh, 22 through 26 here. Um, now immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side. To the other side while he sent the multitudes away when he had sent the multitudes away he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray now when evening came he was alone there but the boat was now in the middle of the sea tossed by the waves and for the wind was con for the by the waves for the wind was contrary now in the fourth watch of the night jesus went to them walking on the sea and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. So honestly, it surprises me still that, still that even in the face of all these miracles and powers that Jesus has displayed so far, that the disciples have witnessed this, and they still lack the faith. But, um, you know, that's a picture for us that we'll talk about more in a minute. And in verse 27, it says, But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. So this is the second time that we see the disciples are caught in a storm. And remember, the previous one was uh, back in the Sea of Galilee. Um, this is the first time. Now, the first time he was with them, but this is the second time and he isn't with them. Um, but Jesus here says, it is I, which translates to I am, which is the divine name of God. If we refer back um, here in, I believe it's uh, James 858. Um, Jesus, said, uh, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Um, so, you know, we see I am again uh, to be the name of God himself. And Jesus is, uses it here when he comforts the disciples, I am. Uh, pointing that he is also, you know, in the triune nature of God, also uh, divine as the Messiah. Um, and it's to reassure them that he is always with them. Physically or not, just as God is with us in our own storms, whether we see him or not. So, moving forward now, and in verse 28 uh, through 30, it says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus, it says here, said, Come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked onto the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind that was boisterous, he was afraid and began to and, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. So here in verses 20 through 30, um, so at first it was Peter's faith and trust that allows him to walk out in the water. Um, but we see that Peter, just being a man, uh, becomes scared of the intensity of the storm around him, and he starts sinking. Um, And now in verse 31, it says, And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? So here um, in the Greek, doubt is uh, distazo. Distazo, part of my Greek here. Uh, it translates more accurately to uh, wavering or hesitation. Now the lesson here uh, is that it wasn't the strength of the storm that makes Peter sink but his doubt. Jesus doesn't rebuke the storm, but he rebukes Peter for his lack of faith. When we Christians, uh, you know, we're like the disciples uh, boat here and that we face the storms of life. Our faith should not waver in these storms, but we have been called through the storms like Peter to do seemingly impossible things in the eyes of the world to glorify God and to build up his kingdom and to walk on water, so to speak. Now, these storms don't stop us, but it's our own lack of faith. Even though God has time and time again shown us that he is the rock which we build our foundation and the peace in these storms and the provider of all of our needs. So, going forward now, verses 32 through 33, um, and it says, When they got onto the boat, the wind ceased. 
Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, him being Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now this is the first time, actually, that the disciples confess Jesus as the Son of God because they know that only God can be worshipped. And of course, now we finish here in verses 34 through 36. And it says, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of... Bear with me here. Gennesaret. And when... The men of that place recognized him. They sent out into all the surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch him of his garment, touch the hem of his garment, and many touched it and were perfectly well. Again, these miracles all pointing to uh, God's redemptive plan for man. So what's the conclusion here from chapter 14? We see that John the Baptist was just a reflection of Christ's ministry. And what was to come from it? It paved the way to show that Jesus' ministry was actually greater than John's, as it was Jesus who would be the one who actually dies and be resurrected uh, for the atonement of our sins, not John the Baptist. And we see again examples of God showing us his redemptive plan through Jesus and the miracles that it was a small sample of what was in store for all, of, uh, for all who have faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He is our provider, and he is our, and he is our, uh, and he is our strength, and our faith should grow th through that. That although we may uh, see doubt in our present circumstances, God is always providential uh, in the end, and that the glory should always be to Him, not ourselves.